Um, so thank you, everybody. And I'm going to talk about, um, indeed, the color of dinosaurs, but more widely how we know or think we know what dinosaurs looked like. And uh, but to begin the story, <laughs> sort of detective story, we go back in time, we go back 25 years. So I'm going to start with a very important meeting at the American Museum for, uh, for, uh, of Natural History in 1996. So here we go, I'll share the screen and make a start. <clears throat> okay. And so the title is Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World. And that's the title of a new book that's just been published this month, which tells a lot of the story I'm talking about. But there's a sort of double thread to this. And the first part is, is a little bit of detective work back in 1996. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went to a meeting at the American Museum of Natural History, here it is, in 1996, and something unusual happened during that meeting. There was a, a headline article in the New York Times called Feathery Fossil Hints Dinosaur Bird Link, written by a journalist called Malcolm Brown, and you'll see the date there, October 19th, 1996. And We've got to turn the clock back because we're so used to the idea of feathered dinosaurs, all these amazing fossils from China. But back in 1996, we absolutely were not. And in fact, nobody had ever found such a thing. And this is a most unusual uh, news article because Malcolm Brown wasn't reporting a paper that had been given at the conference or indeed a poster um, or a paper that had been published. In fact, he was reporting hints and rumors that he was hearing around the corridors at the conference. So that was quite extraordinary. And what he was reporting was that a Chinese paleontologist called Pei Ji Chen from NIGPAS, which is an institute in Nanjing, was walking around the meeting showing pictures of this extraordinary specimen shown on the slide. And this thing is about a meter in length. Uh, it's a small beast with, with, with the eye and, and the body. The whole body is in a very long, tail extending up <clears throat> and he'd shown it to various notable people and indeed he was um, pursued by journalists and what got people excited was not only was this a very complete and very beautiful looking fossil with evident uh, soft parts in the gut area but all the way along the back and along the tail were these tufty black dark colored um, uh, uh, materials and he was sort of asking everybody do you think they're feathers what do you think they are but one person at the meeting, Phil Curry, the re renowned paleontologist from China, he sort of took a double take because he'd just flown back from Beijing. And uh, back in 1996, we have to remind ourselves, it was most unusual for a Westerner to go to China. Um, and he had actually seen a different specimen, this one shown here at the Geological Museum in Beijing. And it seems to be something similar and a couple of geologists at the museum uh, called G and G, um, they published a paper in Chinese language while he was there in their house journal, which is called Chinese Geology. And in that, they described this particular specimen shown in the photograph, um, and they named it as Sinosauropteryx prima, which means something like Chinese reptile wing the first. And at the top of the description, um, oops, go back one. They, they very definitely call it a bird. It's a member of Aves, which is a bit unusual, but they were clearly saying, yes, these are feathers, therefore it must be a bird. A couple of years later, Chen was able to finally publish his paper. He was the guy that was at that American Museum meeting and that led to the, the New York Times report. It took him two years, though, to put together his paper to describe his specimen in Nanjing. And he decided in the end, of course, it's the same beast. It is indeed Sinosauropteryx prima. So sadly, he didn't get the opportunity to give it a name, but this was the first publication in English. However, something might have struck you. What's going on? Here is the Beijing specimen. This is the name holding specimen. Here is the Nanjing specimen. And neither of the professors, Chinese professors who were showing the specimens had any idea that the other specimen existed. And indeed, Phil Curry was the first person in the world to know that, well, except for the smart dealer or collector who had acquired them. 
because clearly what happened, this is a bit of skullduggery. Somebody had found this very important specimen. This is the first feathered dinosaur ever found in the world. And it's the beginning of a, a bone rush, as it's sometimes been called, or a dinosaur rush in China. And yet that smarty pants realized on splitting it open, wow, look at this thing, it's really amazing. I know I'm gonna sell each bit separately and probably got twice as much money. And the museums in Nanjing and Beijing have never been willing to admit um, how much they paid for these, but there we are. This is, this is just a little bit of background, but the important point coming out of this was the amazing fossil. And we'll be coming back to Sinosphoropteryx later in the talk, but it was the beginning, the, the floodgates had opened. But there was a lot of debate and argument. People looked at these um, feather-like structures along the back, and there, was, there were quite a lot of people said, it's clearly not a bird. This is a compsognathid dinosaur. Therefore, these cannot be feathers because only birds have got feathers. That was the kind of argument that they use. But these mark the beginning of, of a big, big change in our understanding. But we need to think, what was the position that we had? It's easy now to, to accept all of this, but what was the position that we were in in 1996 when Peiji Chen came to the meeting and, and what did people understand? Of course, we all knew about Archaeopteryx, the very famous early bird, original bird fossil from the late Jurassic of uh, Germany. And the first specimens famously were found about 1861. Thomas Huxley shown here were, were absolutely lapped it up. He loved it because he was an early convert to Darwin's uh, evolution by natural selection, which had been published two years earlier. And famously Thomas Huxley was often called Darwin's bulldog because Darwin didn't really show himself much in public, whereas Huxley was very much of a public lecturer. And this was the perfect example for somebody who wanted to convince the public about evolution. Of course, this is a very famous story. Here it is, Archaeopteryx, which as Huxley said, is a dinosaur in bird's clothing. The skeleton is a, a small flesh eating dinosaur, but it obviously has got uh, feathers on its wings and on its tail. But that was, we didn't know much more, you know, so after that very um, healthy beginning, the knowledge of the fossil record of birds didn't really advance a great deal all the way through to 1996. And so in a very crude way, all we really knew was here's Archaeopteryx with by, by then about 10 specimens uh, from 150 million years ago. And above it, we've got fossil birds, but mostly they are in the late Cretaceous and Cenozoic, and they mainly belong to the modern groups of birds. So there's quite a long gap there. And then below Archaeopteryx, there was quite a long gap between the nearest dinosaurs and so on. So that was it. It was a very gappy record. And you'll all recall, of course, the creationists, the American creationists love this. They, they lapped it up. Look at this thing, you know, nobody knows what it means. And this shows that evolution is happening super fast. And, you know, this is not what people expect, Darwin, blah, blah, blah. And so it was a very difficult um, and very incomplete knowledge at the time. Along came the fossils from China. And um, I, was, I first went to China in 2007, accompanied by uh, uh, colleagues from Bristol, but, uh, and at that, uh, uh, but also by Paddy Orr, whom some of you may know, um, at uh, University College um, Dublin, head of department there. And so Paddy was a, a more junior person in Dublin at the time, but he'd been in Bristol doing his PhD. He had a great knowledge about um, exceptional preservation was very keen to come to China and off we went. And with the help of, and collaboration of Chinese colleagues, they took us all around. And what you see are the quarries like this. This is Sihetun, which is one of the most famous um, sites. And uh, it's what you see are um, great thicknesses of lake deposits. So this, uh, this cliff on the, the, the right is showing um, many, many thin layers of, of accumulating mud. Uh, representing lake deposition and full of fossils. So this one locality had produced a thousand fossil birds, a thousand. And all we had of Archaeopteryx were 10 measly specimens that had taken a century or more to collect. And here they are in China, just collecting them by the thousand. And the extraordinary thing about the quarry, and this is just one of many, is um, <clears throat> it is so fossil rich. 
and the fossils are exceptionally preserved. They often contain soft tissues. Um, and it seems to connect with the fact that there was a great deal of volcanic activity going on at the time. And indeed there are ash beds and indeed the, 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 the muds in the lakes are full of volcanic ash as well. So it seems to be that the ash has had a, the, the, the acidification of the water and the, the nature of the ash have helped preserve soft tissues in a remarkable way. So these localities are all in Liaoning province, shown in blue on the little map. So Beijing is shown with a red star, Liaoning. It looks close, but it's actually 500 miles away. The, the distances in China are absolutely huge. And these early, these, these late Jurassic to early Cretaceous deposits that are full of feathered birds and dinosaurs, they extend over much of the north of China. So a huge area. And these are commonly referred to the, the, the Cretaceous ones as the Jehol fossils. They belong to the Jehol group, stratigraphic group. And you can see from the list of beasts that these are typical organisms that you would find in an ancient lake as well as a few things like dinosaurs, birds, mammals, and pterosaurs that either live around the edges or fly over and, and fall in from time to time. So just reviewing a few of the feathered dinosaurs, here's Sinoceropteryx, you've seen the fossil already. Here's an early reconstruction of the thing. And I, re I remind you of that debate. It, it is a consognathus, it's not a bird, so G and G got it wrong, but nonetheless, their name stands because it, was, it has priority. <clears throat> and the bristles were interpreted variously as proto feathers on the one hand, or as but the critics said it's just shredded skin. You know, this is nothing to do with feathers or anything at all, they said. Here are some close ups. On the right, you can see um, the tail of another specimen of Sinoceroptrix. The tail bones are slightly pinkish, and you can see these bristle like structures in bunches and notice the way they're sort of in tufty bunches and then there's a gap and another bunch. And there are a number of specimens now that, that, that show this. And you can see why people say, well, they're not feathers, they're just kind of simple strips, they're nothing in particular. However, in the same year as um, Chen's nature paper, Cordypteryx was published in Nature in English. And this was a lot harder to explain away because it not only had um, uh, whiskery feathers all over the body, it also had proper pennate feathers and veined feathers on the on the wings and the tail. And, and the part, some of these on, in the fossil are here. They show all the detail and complexity of a flight feather or a contour feather from a modern bird. And so for the critics, they, they pretty much had to shut up at that point and say, OK, all right, OK, these are feathers. Dinosaurs could have feathers. And I think you can appreciate from this reconstruction of this weird looking creature, it could not fly. It might have, you can imagine a sort of Disney type flying effort. It might flap its wings about, but it wouldn't get off the ground because the wings are not big enough. And then a couple of years later, an astonishing beast was described in yet another paper in Nature, Microraptor, meaning small hunter. There's the fossil at the top, it's very complete. Um, and the feathers are shown beautifully. And it's important to realize these are not impressions of feathers. They actually contain the organic or traces of remnants of or modified organic matter representing precisely um, the composition of the feathers. And you can see a diversity of feather types, including at the tips of the wings, the long primaries, the secondaries nearer into the body, and not only wings on the forelimbs, but wings on the hind lips. That was somewhat unexpected. <clears throat> and we'll come back to this in a minute because this beast almost certainly could fly if you look at the area of the total area of wing in proportion to the size of the body. It almost certainly could get itself off the ground and flap about. Lots of fossil birds were found, so it wasn't only feathered dinosaurs. I mentioned Confucius Ornus already. It had indeed been named a year earlier than um, Sinoceropteryx, so the feathered dinosaurs were not unexpected. People had already begun hearing rumors of these astonishing fossil beds in Northeast China. And with Confucius Ornus, we apparently have males and females, long tail feathers and all kinds of exciting stuff like that. And I'm not going to go into further detail on those fossils other than to say generally what was the impact on our knowledge. So in sum, since 1996, over 50 feathered dinosaur species and 50 bird species have been named. So that's a, a hundred new fossil species. And so they massively fill up those gaps. If you remember back to the diagram of 
of Archaeopteryx and the dinosaurs and the modern birds, these Chinese fossils hugely fill up the gaps above and below Archaeopteryx. And it's not just that we want to fill the gaps, we actually want to look at the nature of these fossils. What do they tell us about the evolution of birds in flight? Because, of course, um, Huxley was right, Darwin was right, indeed the creationists are right in the sense that the origin of birds and the origin of flight is one of the best uh, examples to study, to try to understand how a, a major a success in evolution can happen. You know, today there are 10,000 species of birds. We would say birds are successful in evolutionary terms. How did they achieve it? And when we were studying Archaeopteryx as students 25, 30 years ago, Archaeopteryx had 30 unique bird traits like hollow bones, the wishbone, the fused clavicles, specializations in the hands and the arm, the toes, the feathers. Virtually all of these 30 unique cat, well, all of them have now been found in dinosaurs. So the point is that's, that's an example of, of, of how these new fossils have, have really uh, improved our knowledge. It doesn't mean Archaeopteryx isn't important, but what it means is we, we filled a lot of gaps. The evolution is not happening in that kind of sudden way. Boom, there's suddenly a bird with these 30 unique features. In fact, they began appearing much, much earlier. And secondly, you can do functional studies, of course, because across the top of this diagram are a series of wings. So all the way from a dinosaur on the left, or Sinusauropteryx, in fact, on the left, through to a crow on the right. And we want to know about flight. And, and of course, the wing is so important. And if you can reconstruct the wing of these fossil animals in detail, which you can, then you can determine whether they could fly or not, or, or how well they could fly. And also we can estimate um, changes in body size. So the detail of this evolutionary tree doesn't matter, but what we're looking at is the evolution of the theropod dinosaurs, the flesh eaters, all the way through the Mesozoic. And I've marked with um, orange blobs, the so-called giants. So of course we all think about the giant theropods. T-Rex is right up here uh, in the Maastrichtian. And there were other independently different groups of theropods in Africa, South America, also became equally huge. But on the line to birds, something different was happening. So over here in the box on the right are the birds. And if you follow through the little silhouettes, they were getting smaller and smaller. So there's a long phase of miniaturization going on in that particular line of birds. The ones that were particularly well feathered, the ones that were ultimately to include the ancestors of birds. And last year, a fantastic paper was published, uh, which actually showed for the first time that powered flight, that means proper wing flapping flight, like we see in birds, didn't just evolve in birds. It evolved three or four times in different groups of these little theropod dinosaurs. And we, we, we know this for a fact, because of course, if you've got a beast like uh, Microraptor, here's a different reconstruction on the left. As long as you can calculate the area of the wing, which is simply what it says in square centimeters, and you can estimate the body mass, which I think you can reasonably do by comparing the size of the body of this thing with living birds, and I can't remember exactly what it's like, maybe the size of a pigeon, something like that. So you know how much a pigeon weighs, and there are simple formulae in aerodynamics that give you the relationship between body size and uh, wing area. And when the wing, relative wing area exceeds a certain threshold, the animal takes off and flies. Below the threshold, of course, it cannot engage in power flight. It may be able to glide. So the, the Microraptor evolved flight independently and using a different mechanism, four wings. This weird thing in the middle is Shi Yi, um, which had uh, strange membrane-like wings. It also could fly and various others. So it looks as if flight originated multiple times. And birds were just one of several, but it stuck with birds. They were the ones that survived for a long time. So here's the paper that Betty was referring to and which I was talking about uh, back when I visited Cork in person back in 2011. And um, we were very excited back then because we believed, we strongly believed, in fact, we were sure that we had determined the color of feathers uh, and the color of fossil, the color of a dinosaur. And you'll see from the list of authors, there are a number of Chinese authors from Beijing, 
Stuart Cairns from Bristol, Paddy Orr from Dublin, myself, and a bunch of others from different locations. And so the title tells you two things, fossilized melanosomes. So I'll say a word about melanosomes in a second. And uh, we're, we're kind of saying we've got the color of birds and dinosaurs. And it did create quite a splash at the time. Um, here's our beast. This is Sinoceroptrix over on the left, showing it as ginger with a nice stripy tail. And unknown to us until about a week before our paper came out, or in fact, just a few days before, a, 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 an alternative group or a rival group, you could call it, based at Yale University in the States, they were working on a different dinosaur, Anchiornis. And this is their reconstruction. And, and it had an astonishing array of um, patterns of stripes and spots and a nice gingery crest and, and various blacks and whites and so on. So we hit the same result at about the same time. And just to be really super clear, what we were saying was this, any reconstruction, we could look at reconstructions of, of Sinoceroptrix and we could adamantly say this one is incorrect because the colors are quite wrong. And we would say this one that we had produced, some of one of our artists in Beijing produced, this is correct. And this is not a matter of opinion, this is based on evidence. So we would argue this is science. So what are these melanosomes? This is the thing, this is the key. And just as a, a, an analogy, we need, in all these cases, it's a commonality in earth sciences, we keep referring to the present because the present is the key to the past. So we're using a strong principle of uniformitarianism in this particular um, study. And so what we have here is a zebra finch. All the different colors and patterns of feathers are due to the pigment melanin. And I think most people have heard of melanin as a very common pigment. You may think of it typically as giving brown and black colors, even gray colors. Um, <clears throat> but that's one type of melanin called properly eumelanin. And there's another type called pheomelanin that gives ginger colors. And so the patch of ginger on the cheek of the zebra finch is pheomelanin. And when we looked at the feathers, here's a feather plucked from one of these. You can see at different points along the feather, you've got all the different colors, black and ginger and white. And so when we, when we uh, freeze dried the feather and cracked it open and looked at it under the scanning electron microscope, in the cheek area, all we could see were these kinds of melanosomes, which are spherical. So the little ball shaped structures, <clears throat> and these are properly called pheomelanosomes, indicating the ginger color. Whereas in the dark brown and black and gray areas, we saw that the feathers were full of these sausage shaped um, eumelanosomes. And they, they seem to be associated with the color. And so we looked at the fossil and here it is at the top right. This then is under the scanning electron microscope. This is a piece of tissue from the feather of Sinoceroptrix. Uh, and it's 150, it's 100 million, 120 million years old, and yet the melanosomes are still there. So they're a bit squished, but where you can see them, they are spherical, they're mainly moldic, meaning they are impressions pressed into the, uh, the, the, the tissue of the feather as it is preserved there. And if we flick back briefly to the previous slide, we can see they resemble these top ones, the pheomelanosomes, the ginger. So that's our line of reasoning. Here's the fossil. We take samples from various parts of the feathers all over the body and the tail. We look at them. All we find are pheomelanosomes. So we reconstruct with a generally ginger color and none of the other colors. And in the tail region, very definitely um, ginger and white stripes. So the whole tail we sampled between, we sampled in the pale areas and the dark areas along the tail and that's confirmed. So this is what we can call a chain of inference. We have a line of reasoning, and this is testable. We can be refuted. So you might have thought a few minutes ago, if somebody asked you what color were dinosaurs, you would say, oh, we need a, unless you've heard a lecture by Maria, of course, you would say, oh, we need a time machine to go back in time. And I'd say, no, you don't, because we have a testable hypothesis here. And this takes a little bit of thinking, but it's important to fix this because often, Geologists can often be a wee bit apologetic. We can say, oh, well, yes, of course, a lot of what we do is making guesses or inferences about the past. We're not really doing uh, scientific experiments because you think of the school chemistry, the school physics, where you repeat an experiment that's been done a thousand times before and you know what the result will be and you get that result and hence you've confirmed 
a well-established principle. But a chain of inference is equally testable. Here are the ways it can be tested. Anybody can look at any specimen of Sinoceropteryx. They don't need to look at the specimens we looked at. They can find a new one completely and they can take a sample. They can prepare the sample in an appropriate way, maybe in a slightly different way than we did. They can look at it under any scanning electron microscope they like. And if they see something different than what we saw, well, already there might be a doubt then, okay, maybe they got it wrong. But people have done this so far and they've kept seeing the same thing. And the, the one area of the um, chain of inference that could be open to question is the stability of this relationship of melanosome shape and melanosome color. You can easily criticize us by, and say, well, if this is what happens in the zebra finch, who's to say this is what happens in any dinosaur? But of course, the answer to that is, well, we checked much more widely than just the zebra finch. And in fact, this is an absolutely fixed relationship between the two different uh, pigments, each of which is chemically different from the other, and the shape of the melanosomes and the overall size is very constant across all birds, and not only across all birds, but also across all mammals, including ourselves. So if one of you has ginger hair, you will have pheomelanosomes in your hair, and they will be spherical in shape because this is a standard, it seems to be, this is a standard relationship of shape to pigment to color uh, and occurs across all tetrapods. So therefore it occurred in dinosaurs. We have no reason to think that dinosaurs, we've got no reason to think that chemistry was different in the uh, Cretaceous than it is today. That'd be a rather crazy idea. And therefore, if we accept that chemistry and biochemistry would have been the same, the rules and the principles and the chemical structures and all the other things, therefore, there we are. But it is testable in the ways I've mentioned. We could be refuted. It, this could be rejected. It stood for 11 years, so let's see. Not been rejected yet. And so here's the new reconstruction by Bob Nichols. <clears throat> this, uh, when I show it in a, in a live room with students and so on, they sort of gasp. Because Bob Nichols, I should say a brief word, um, he's a, a fantastic paleo artist. He's been doing uh, reconstructions of dinosaurs and other beasts for the past 20 years. He now does them uh, using digital media. So this reconstruction is a digital image. He could render it in three dimensions, two, dimension, two dimensions. You could scale it up as large as you like, look at every individual feather and it's all, all the detail is there. It's just totally fantastic. So Nichols has illustrated the book. He's provided 15 amazing reconstructions. And the claim we make in the book is we've chosen our 15 beasts carefully because we've chosen those where we can justify and explain and provide evidence for every aspect of the color and the pattern. And so we're making a claim that our new book is the first one where none of the colors or patterns or the overall reconstructions are in any way fanciful. They are all evidence-based. Not to say they're correct, but they're the best that can possibly be done. And almost every other dinosaur book will have one or two of these beasts where we have this knowledge, but there's still going to be a great number that there's a lot of guesswork. Here's the book, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World. Now you'll maybe understand why we chose that title. In fact, it wasn't published in September, it was published in late October because the box of thousands of copies got stuck somewhere in the Suez Canal or something like that and took ages for them to come through. So I'm gonna tell you two or three further stories just to give you an insight into the way um, we, we can go beyond that and, and what's been done in the last, uh, the last um, 11 years. And Cetacosaurus, um, meaning literally the parrot dinosaur because of its parrot-like beak, it's a very different beast. It's a um, herbivore. It's not totally covered in feathers. In fact, it's largely covered in scaly skin. Um, it does have feather-like structures on the tail, that very weird thing that looks, you might think that's a bit of a sort of row of reeds in the background. No, they are attached to mum. That's part of her. She's got this extraordinary collection of structures on the tail. And these are four babies. So how do we know all this? What, because remember, I'm making a big claim about the book that we're trying to choose uh, different dinosaurs and other prehistoric beasts where 
we have a rich knowledge of what they really look like, the colors and, and, and patterns. So first of all, babies. We know lots of babies of Cetacosaurus. It's also from the same age rocks as Sinoceropteryx, early Cretaceous. This is from another locality in Liaoning called Lujiatun, which um, preserves purely um, ash beds with dinosaurs. So this particular locality has come to be known as the Chinese Pompeii, because unlike the other beds, which are lake deposited, they may contain ash, but they're, they're essentially lake water deposited uh, uh, sediments. In this case, almost certainly the sediments is pure ash and it's airfall. And the dinosaurs in this case have been trapped in the ash. So the fossil at the top was studied by a student of mine in Bristol, and it shows six babies, all pointing the same way. The heads are all to the left. And we have, we have a sort of fanciful story. This we can't, of course, prove that they were clustering together. They were probably close relatives, so siblings, maybe clustering for protection. And they were running away from the volcano, just like all the stories about Pompeii. And they couldn't run fast enough and the hot ash fell and killed them. And of course the ash burns off all the soft tissue. So these particular ones don't have any skin or anything. And we're able to study the relative ages of these. They're two years old, except for the pink one, who's three. So this is big brother for some reason, hanging about with the babies. Um, but this, this is the one that gave the color. This is an amazing specimen in the Senckenberg Museum in Frankfurt. And it doesn't come from Lugia Tun, but it comes from one of the um, uh, regular uh, lake beds where the, the feathered dinosaurs come from. And in this fossil, it's very complete. The head end is to the uh, right, the tail to the left. And on the top of the tail, you might just about be able to make out this dense array of long reed-like feather structures, impressions of them. And otherwise the rest of the body is richly covered in skin. And you can see some areas are quite dark. And of course, it's very important to be clear about whether that dark color comes from melanin in the skin or from the internal organs, because you can see in the lower part of the rib cage, some lumpy bits, which are probably the guts and some other internal parts of the beast. And then behind the leg and in front of the shoulder, you can maybe see there are some paler patches in the sort of bum region and the back of the leg and the back of the head and the shoulder. And you may be able to make out around the shoulder that it's pale with dark splotches. So <clears throat> when Jakob Winter did a, a detailed, with colleagues, did a detailed reconstruction of this beast, based on that single specimen, they were able to reconstruct it in all these different views. And you can see the lovely speckled uh, patterns over the shoulders and uh, behind the hind legs and the distribution of dark and pale. So this particular dinosaur shows a kind of counter shading, which any biologist amongst you will be familiar with, the idea of counter shading, that it's, many animals today have it, and it's to do with camouflage, it's to make your body look less three-dimensional and a bit more two-dimensional. And because this has got rather low level, um, in other words, the line between the dark and the pale is lying quite low, that implies that this thing was living in maybe dappled woodlands. And to some extent, the dappling and, and the dark color over the back um, are to allow it to hide, uh, you know, in, in, in the typical, typical middle of the day with sunlight dappling through trees and so on, this thing could move around and its own pattern is probably some sort of camouflage. And so there closer up is the reconstruction we tentatively show some little tufty feathers along the tail of the baby. We've got no idea whether that's true or not, but the big one definitely is reconstructed in great detail based upon the um, Senckenberg specimen. My third story is about a pterosaur. And indeed, this is not a dinosaur. The pterosaurs are the cousins of dinosaurs, and they've long been known to have insulating structures, which are sometimes called pycnofibers because people wanted to make it clear that they're not feathers like birds and they're not uh, hairs like mammals, they're something different. Uh, and that's not unreasonable. This, this, this little one shown here from the middle um, Jurassic is probably about the size of, of a pigeon or a small seagull. And it's shown as really quite substantially whiskery. 
The important point, though, is when we worked on this, and this was jointly with Maria and a number of other colleagues from China, and uh, again, Paddy Orr is in there, and uh, colleagues from the United States and elsewhere, China mainly. The thing that first of all surprised us was that the pycnofibers fibers were not uniquely um, simple bristles, figure E, which is what we'd expected. In fact, we found lots of them were tufty, and you can see F, G, and H, tufty at the end or halfway along or at the base. And so the conclusion of this paper back in 2019 um, was a wee bit controversial as well, like the 2010 paper. We pretty much said um, these pterosaur pycnofibers actually are feathers. <clears throat> and that's not unexpected because although pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, they are the cousins of dinosaurs. So they are indeed closely related. But if this is the case, this brings the origin of feathers way, way back in time because up until 1996, the oldest feathers, of course, were in Archaeopteryx, 150 million years ago, the very end of the Jurassic. Now, because of the date at which dinosaurs originated, which is early Triassic and, and split off from pterosaurs, this brings the origin of feathers all the way back to the early Triassic, 250 million years ago. We don't have any Triassic feathers. These are Jurassic. But of course, the shape of the evolutionary tree, which is based on independent evidence absolutely shows that the origin must go all that way back. Here's Bob's fantastic reconstruction of this beast. Um, and this is an insect eater. It appears to have a happy smiling face. I'm sure what looks happy to us was not at all happy to the pterosaur, but that doesn't matter. That's what it looked like. And it's got a whiskery face <clears throat> and the whiskers are to help it tra trap insects, and it's just spotted this rather juicy looking lace wing, which is going to swoop upon and grab. Here's another pterosaur. The pterosaurs ranged in shape and size enormously. Most of those up to the end of the Jurassic were pretty sensible looking things, but once you get into the Cretaceous, they are completely bonkers. This, this is by no means the biggest pterosaur, but it is utterly, utterly crazy. And when you look at the skeleton on the uh, right, this is in a museum display, that's the relative size as it is. The head is bigger than the body. And you think if you want to be a flyer and kind of lightweight, you're not gonna waste uh, material on this crazy great big skull and the huge lower jaw and this ridiculous kind of crest thing. But there we are, that's what it looks like. And the fossil in the middle, which if we home in on it a little bit, um, it, you know, if you found that, you think, what the heck is this? You know, but the lower jaw at the bottom, toothless, it's got this pointy little pert, pursed, pursed little mouth and this great long um, strut, hollow strut back and then another one. And this crumply looking area in between is actually fossil skin and um, preserved within it are melanosomes, which were described a, a number of years ago. And there are further specimens of this yielding fantastic information. Um, and we'll hear more about it, I'm sure, in due course. But at the moment, this is what we know. And indeed, within that skin, the melanosomes show patterns of pigmentation, a sort of blotchy pattern, maybe even photoluminescent, that somehow during the daytime, these patches of paler color could pick up some energy from the sun and then use that to transmit some sort of flashes after dusk. Be that as it may, Overall, Tupandactylus, here it is with its crazy huge head. But of course, that head is extraordinarily lightweight because it's all just hollow. Um, but nonetheless, in life, this then makes us start to think, what on earth was all this for? And probably like the pattern tails and other structures in the dinosaurs, this very likely is for some kind of signaling between members of the species, something like that. My final story then is comes from Canada. So this is just to remind us that not all of these extraordinary fossils are uh, from China. And indeed I should have uh, clarified Tupandactylus is from Brazil. So <clears throat> indeed China has been our best source, but it's very important to realize that we do get these kinds of amazing preservations elsewhere. So here are the Athabasca tar sands about which we hear from time to time. And it is a very ugly place and I'm sure attend attendees at COP26 would immediately say, shut it down, it's terrible. Because of course, what they're doing is removing uh, oil-rich sand and, and boiling it up and taking, this, taking the oil out. It's the, 
It's one of the easiest locations from which oil is being recovered at the present time. But my goodness, the environmental um, uh, mess that's being made is huge. Um, so 10 years ago, uh, an enormous dinosaur skeleton was found in this, and it was collected by my former student, Don Henderson, who's got one of the best jobs in the world. He's the head of dinosaurs in Dinosaur Provincial Park. What more could you ask for? And here it is after about seven or eight years of preparation. It's a big, big beast. You're looking at the head of an armored dinosaur. The head is over on the right. And behind the head are, are, the, the, are these skirts of um, bony plates uh, and then bony plates covering the whole body. So it's got a great armored body. And uh, this was described in 2017 where it was noted that not, not only were the bony plates preserved, but also the horn coatings uh, and the horn properly is the protein keratin. So in life, uh, not only, are, I should, should have said earlier, but not only are hair and feathers examples of keratin, they're made of keratin, our fingernails are too. And, and so that gives you an idea of what keratin is like. It, it's a sort of flexible, transparent protein. And, and therefore, it, it makes an ideal um, structure. And of course, that's why melanosomes have to sort of punch their way into that to make hollows in which they can contain the pigment. But in, in life, no vertebrate has naked bone exposed. So just like the bony plates in the back of a crocodile, this dinosaur, although it's covered in bony plates, they were all covered in horn. And that that uh, keratin, that horn in this particular specimen of Bar Borealopelta, as it was called, contain uh, uh, traces of um, pheomelanin. And so the reconstruction, and this is the last wow moment, is here. Here is uh, Bob's reconstruction of Borealopelta, fantastic, uh, extraordinary creature. You look at it and don't think this is just like a little tortoise. It's certainly armored like a tortoise, but with additional knobs on. And this thing is more, uh, more the size and weight of a Sherman tank. This is a serious dinosaur. And those um, scimitar-like blades um, over the shoulders are about a meter in length, just to give you an estimate of the size. And so this thing did have predatory enemies. It's a plant eater itself. It normally would simply protect itself by hunkering down and tucking its legs and head and tail down and um, relying on its armor. But clearly, if there was a more persistent theropod, it could hoist itself up and swing at the predator. And of course, if it cut through the tissue of the predator with those scimitar-like plates, the, the predator would soon disappear. Anyway, there we are. So there's a vision of a variety of dinosaurs. And I just want to summarize where we are, because of course there's, there's a deeper message to a lot of this, which is let's stop being apologetic. We're earth scientists, we're paleontologists, we study the past. We actually have access to remarkable data. And if we use the data sensibly, we can determine a great deal about the past in a factual way, in a testable scientific way. So I've explained how we would regard all of these reconstructions as scientifically testable because the, the, there is a method, there's a, there's a pipeline, there's a sequence of study. You, you look at this, you analyze this, you use this piece of equipment, you compare with the modern day uniformitarianism, you make these deductions. And at each step along the way, you could fall, you know, you could be disproved. And we do the same things for these other aspects of the lifestyle of dinosaurs. I'm not going to talk about them in any detail because my main purpose was to talk about color, but we do the same for thing for speed. You can calculate running speed from the spacing of tracks and you can do it from estimates of the dimensions of the muscles. Uh, because the uh, dimensions of muscles are proportional to the uh, forces those muscles can express. And so we can calculate, we can estimate running speed of T-Rex in two ways, 27 kilometers per hour from the footprints, 27 kilometers per hour from the uh, estimated muscle dimensions. Do we believe that that's correct? I would say we should, that's correct. It can be tested each way, along, each step along the way. I'm not explaining the, the full chain of reasoning, but you can probably see how it would be done. Likewise, in feeding, here are the two ways to calculate the bite force of T-Rex. On the left is a piece of triceratops bone that a T-Rex has bitten into. We've got the tooth mark there. It's about three centimeters deep. 
And uh, paleontologists have done physical experiments where they drive a tooth, a model tooth into a piece of modern bone, and they estimate the bite force, which is several thousand newtons that is needed. And you can cross check by doing um, 3D models. And why would we believe a model? You know, you can make a 3D model in the computer like this. This is a perfect model of a T-Rex skull with the muscles reconstructed, bits of food in yellow. Why would we believe it? Well, my colleague in Bristol, uh, Professor Emily Rayfield, has made a very cogent argument on this. So on the right is her study, her PhD study of uh, T-Rex. And the, the skull is here at the top. You scan it, you simplify it into a, a kind of meshwork structure at B. You then apply material properties to each cell of that structure. You apply various forces to test, could it twist this way or that way? Could it withstand this or that bite force? And this, these diagrams indicate stresses. Hot indicates high stress and blue, low stress. Why would we believe that? Well, if you've ever gone in a modern building or an aircraft or walked across a modern bridge, you believe finite element analysis. You've given your life. You have risked your life on an assumption that finite element analysis works. So, oops, we would, we would argue that it works for um, the fossils as well. So, oops, I've, I've, I've stopped sharing for the minute. That's not what I meant to do. <laughs> One minute. I will just start sharing to finish my lecture. I do apologize for that. There we go. I was getting overexcited and share. And here we go. So um, we trust our lives to it because all the models, all the pre preparatory work that is done for these modern structures is done using these methods. And so finally, um, I've made maybe three points. Number one is the simple one. We can tell the colors and patterns of certain fossil reptiles. And that leads to consequences where we begin to think, well, why would they have all these patterns? So we're opening up new avenues of uh, contemplation of behavior that we wouldn't have thought of before. Secondly, very importantly, we can now make a very strong case that all these areas, indeed, pretty much all areas of earth sciences can be cast into chain of inference uh, approaches, testable and hence scientific. So if you're ever discussing with a, a chemist or a physicist or a mathematician, just keep that in mind. Don't, don't apologize, say, no, no, what we do is science, let me explain. And then the final one is how much we have learned, the amazing impact of the fossils from China and how much we have learned in only 25 years. For, for, for many of you, 25 years may seem like a lifetime. But for people such as myself and a number of others who are a bit longer in the tooth, 25 years is a mere nothing. And to realize that so much change has happened in our field in that relatively short time is, is, is quite an eye opener. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. <laughs>